Schönen guten Abend und herzlich willkommen hier im Kino des Deutschen Filmmuseums zu unserer Reihe Lecture in Film mit dem Titel Easier Than Painting, die Filme von Andy Warhol. Und ähm, ja, wir nähern uns dem Ende des ersten Semesters und da ragt ein Highlight an das andere. Heute haben wir einen Gast aus Spanien da, der ein absoluter Warhol-Experte ist. Marc Siegel wird ihn gleich nochmal ausführlicher vorstellen und wir werden einen Film sehen, den man sonst nicht nur selten sieht, sondern über den man auch selten was lesen kann. Ähm, das ist vielleicht auch nochmal was ganz Interessantes. Ähm, direkt dazu gesagt, wie immer ist dieser Film in Originalkopie, also 16 mm Originalfassung, in dem Fall stumm, <lacht> hier auf der Leinwand zu sehen. Der Film wird, das ist vielleicht auch noch interessant zu erwähnen, in Originalgeschwindigkeit abgespielt, also in Stummfilmgeschwindigkeit mit 16 Bildern pro Sekunde, was dann doch auch anders wirkt, wie alle, die bei Sleep dabei waren, vielleicht wissen. Das ist doch nochmal so ein ganz anderes Gefühl, wenn man Warhol in dieser Geschwindigkeit dann sieht. Ähm, wir, ja genau, auch der Hinweis noch, es wird einen Rollenwechsel geben, ähm, das ist die Beschaffenheit des Materials, dann in unserem 16mm Projektor muss dann die Rolle gewechselt werden, das ist dann eine kurze Pause von zwei bis drei Minuten, wo der Bildschirm schwarz bleibt, das gehört dazu, wundern Sie sich nicht, danach geht es direkt weiter mit der zweiten Rolle. Und ich möchte natürlich auch gerne auf unser Begleitprogramm noch hinweisen, denn jeden Mittwoch und Samstag zeigen wir um 18 Uhr Filme, die den Begriff des Popkinos, äh, ja, erklären und, und zeigen, welche Facetten da dazu gehören. Das sind jetzt in den nächsten Wochen äh, Coffee and Cigarettes von Jim Jarmusch, Blue in the Face von Paul Auster und Wayne Wang und ich möchte ganz besonders angesichts des heutigen Films auf den Dokumentarfilm von Imal Di Antonio hinweisen, Painter's Painting, der sich mit der New Yorker Kunstszene äh, zwischen 1940 und 1970 beschäftigt. Den zeigen wir dann Anfang Februar. Ja, ansonsten bleibt mir nicht viel mehr zu sagen als viel Vergnügen heute Abend und ich übergebe das Wort an Marc Siegel. Viel Spaß. Danke, Urs Spree. Und ich freue mich, dass Sie alle da sind. Ich werde jetzt ins Englische wechseln. I'm particularly thrilled to welcome Juan Suarez back to Frankfurt tonight. Um, Juan is one of the most important contemporary voices on avant-garde film. Und ich sollte vielleicht sagen, um, eine der bescheidensten dafür. Um, Suarez is the author of numerous publications on the literary and visual avant-garde, contemporary aesthetics, queer studies, and experimental cinema. He's the author of the first scholarly book to offer a study of key American avant-garde filmmakers in relation to sexual politics. And here I mean the filmmakers Kenneth Anger, Jack Smith, and Andy Warhol. I'm referring, um, perhaps of course, to the delightfully titled and by now almost classic study, Bike Boys, Drag Queens and Superstars from 1997. But since that publication, he has continued to devote himself to American and international avant-garde work with essays on pre and post-war American experimental film, structural film and Puerto Rican influences in the American underground among a number of other subjects. In addition to Bike Boys, Suarez has written two other books, Pop Modernism, Noise and the Reinvention of the Everyday from 2007, and in the same year, the first full-length English language study on the films of Jim Jarmusch. He is a frequent guest lecturer in cinema studies at New York University and other universities in Europe and North America. And he works as professor for actually for 19th century North American literature, as if there was such a thing. Uh, there was, I, I, I could say that, um, at uh, the University of Murcia in Spain. When we invited Juan to speak in the series, he was actually the only um, person who we contacted who said, oh, I would love to come. Um, and which films would you like me to speak about? And he listed about five or six films um, which, um, about which he can speak. So he's quite uh, fluent in um, discourse of Andy Warhol's films and quite familiar with the films. I'm personally very happy that he chose a film that I have never seen 
and that I'm very excited to see and particularly very excited to hear what he has to say about it. So please join me in welcoming Juan Suarez. Well, thank you very much, for Mark, for this um, introduction. Uh, I wanted to thank also very especially Henning Engelke, Regina Pranger, um, uh, Vincent Hediger, and again Mark Siegel for inviting me to this really wonderful series. Uh, and thank you, of course, uh, f uh, to the staff at the Film Museum, and very especially Urs Perry, who's been like right on top of you know, or, you know, organizational matters, and you know the various people who have uh, helped me with technical issues today. And thank you for coming. I mean, I'm sure there are other things in Frankfurt to do tonight, and you know, I'm very happy to see uh, quite a crowd. Uh, the film Henry Gelsaler. Uh, you're seeing, you know, one of the Im an images from it is one of the least con conspicuous in Warhol's minimalist canon. By minimalist canon, I mean the early silent films that Warhol made in 1963 and 64, not all of which are actually that minimal. This is the period that runs from the time that he shot his first films, shortly after he acquired a wind-up Bolex camera in July of 1963, to the time when he shifted to the production of Talkies, the sound films he started to make at the very end of 1964. As one of the minimal titles, Henry Gelsaler is much less celebrated and therefore less frequently screened and known than other films of this early phase. It does share the somewhat elegant premise of other films from this period, such as Kiss or Eat, in that the title uh, sorry, gives away its content. It is a film of Warhol's good friend at the time, critic, critic and curator Henry, Henry Gelsaler, this gentleman here, uh, uh, just totally being Henry Gelsaler, just totally being himself on camera. Although I will eventually come around to what being someone might amount to, especially when mediated through film. Henry Gelsaler doesn't have the erotic innuendo of blowjob with the evocation of off-screen sexual activity whose result we see in the face of the film's protagonist, nor, nor does it have the frank eroticism of Couch, a film that contains some nudity and several sexual encounters between factory regulars. And it never acquired the aura of epic jest, of an epic joke that um, uh, envelops the much longer empire or sleep. You may remember that that's an image from sleep. You may, you may remember that the empire is a static shot of the Empire State Building taken on a summer evening from sundown to approximately 4 a.m., running just over eight hours. And sleep consists of 22 different shots of poet John Giorno, fast asleep. The shots of this film are edited and recombined in such a way that the film lasts about five hours and 20 minutes at silent speed. Henry Gelsaler is similar to Empire, Sleep, and Eat. Uh, Eat is 28 minutes of you know a friend, another friend of Warhol eating a mushroom. Uh, like these films, Henry Gelsaler emphasizes duration and distended temporality. Yet Henry Gelsaler seems to me is much closer to Empire than to the other two. Uh, you know. Uh, you know, uh, uh, eat or, or, or sleep. Both eat and sleep were put together in small increments. They were shot with a Bolex, a camera whose cartridge could only fit 100 feet film rolls, the equivalent of about four minutes of film at sound speed. While sleep is much more intricately edited and more complexly framed than eat, both films have a hiccuping s s structure, you know, it's like a hiccup. Like, um, as some of the shots are looped and recur in different moments. Like Empire, however, Henry Gelsaler is made up of longer fragments, two 1,200 foot reels, eh, 1,200 foot reels, that screened at the silent speed of 16 frames per second bring the film's length to 99 minutes. Eh? So it's not, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's made of, you know, longer fragments. It's not like, uh, you know, made, put together out of small increments. Uh, the film is in some ways a fallout from the shoot of Empire. It was filmed the following day when, uh, you know, after Empire was made, Sunday, July 26, 1964, with the same camera, a rented Oricon camera. Uh, it was a camera that allowed for the capture of image and sound uh, simultaneously. Um, 
uh, but the camera was used perversely with the sound turn off just to capture image. The camera was not due back at the rental shop until the following Monday, so Warhol, legendarily thrifty, decided to optimize expenses by making, by making a film of his friend. In this manner, he could also use the two reels left over from the marathon session of the previous evening when he shot Empire. Warhol summoned Gelt Saller to the factory in the afternoon of July 26th, where the latter found the camera already set up on its tripod pointing at the famous red velvet Art Deco couch. Gilzaller was asked to see it and the camera was turned on and just recorded his presence just as the previous day it had recorded that of the Empire State. Here is Gilzaller's description of the event and this is from an interview that was carried out in the 70s. Well, this is Gilzaller's account. So he said, I called Andy and he was making a film. I got to the studio and said, what are you making a film of? And he said, of you. I said, what should I do? He said, smoke a cigar. I had a big cigar with me. I was also stoned, mildly stoned, on some good pot, if I remember correctly. I said, how long is the film going to be? And he said, an hour and a half. And Gelsaller said, what should I do? He said, don't do anything. Just sit there and smoke a cigar. So I sat, this is Gelsaller uh, talking, so I sat on the edge of the couch. I was horrified because Andy didn't stand behind the camera. He didn't tell me to move. He put the magazine, the, you know, the, the reel of film on. He loaded it. He started it. He went to make some phone calls and he'd be back once in a while and wave at me. It was a fantastic experience for me. First of all, because the hour and a half went by so quickly. I mean, he was stoned. Uh, but seeing the film, I suddenly realized that Andy's nature is really a great portraitist. And, and that if you sit somebody in front of a camera for an hour and a half and don't tell them what to do, they're going to do everything, their whole vocabulary. I went through my entire history of gestures. I could see from viewing the film later that it gave me away completely the extent to which I am infantile, the extent to which I am me megalomaniacal, all the things one tries to hide come through the film. And this is the end of his account. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, this is not the first portrait Warhol had taken of his friend. Uh, there is a reel that is supposedly the first reel that uh, Warhol ever shot in July of 1963 that shows Henry Gelsaller smoking a cigar, then you know, throwing the, the cigar in the toilet, flushing it, and then brushing his teeth. Um, uh, uh, the conception, but, but, you know, that film is, you know, different from this one. The conception of this longer film is closer to the screen tests that Warhol had started to take probably at the beginning of 1964, a few months before this particular portrait. In fact, Henry Gell Saller is best read, I think, as an extended screen test, as an extended scre screen test. Well, the regular screen tests were made with a bolex, with a camera that fits, you know, smaller you know, fragments of film uh, in 100 foot reels, Gail Saller's portrait takes up, takes up much longer. The attempt to approximate the still image that is that was predominant in some of the screen tests when Warhol and his, assist, his assistants would tell people to just, you know, sit still and not do anything, not even blink, uh, you know, this pretense, you know, to approximate the still image is forsaken from the start as Gail Saller, that's another image from another screen test, as Gail Saller cannot possibly try to resemble a still picture for over an hour. So from the start, he just fidgets, fidgets, settles and resettles on the couch for the duration of the shoot. And while some screen tests give rise to brief bursts of self-dramatization and performing wit, Gail Saller sustains the game, sustains the, you know, the performing game for quite some time, so long in fact that he appears at times drained from the exposure and takes a break covering his face with his hands um, or feigning sleep, pretending to be asleep, as if demanding time out from this exposure. Uh, this wouldn't be the last time that Gail Saller posed for Warhol's camera. He appears fleetingly in a number of films from 1964 and 65. In addition, in 1965, he sat for a conventional screen test, which was found among the films projected behind the Velvet Underground in the Exploding Plastic Inevitable shows. The screen test shows him, in Kali Angel's words, quote, placidly untying and removing his necktie, turning his collar up, retying the tie, and smoothing his collar down again. End of quote. It is worth noticing that all these portraits of Gail Saller are similarly task-oriented. You know, he brushes his teeth, smokes, takes off his tie and puts it back on, plays with his shirt collar. The trifling, playful quality of their content 
contrasts with the idiom of psychological depth that Gelsaler himself used to describe his experience of watching the film. And yet, most readings of the film have picked up on the seriousness of Gelsaler's account and added other ingredients to the mix. I, just meant, I will just mention three readings. Collie Angel, for example, rephrases Gelsaler's idea that the film, quote, used the unmitigated scrutiny of the camera to gradually evoke hidden aspects of Gelsaler's personality, end of quote. She, uh, Angel detours the film through the defiles of high culture and sees in the setting and in Gelsaler's pose a graphic parallel with Pablo Picasso's 1906 portrait of Gertrude Stein uh, at, in the Metropolitan Museum collection. Henry Gelsaler was a curator for contemporary art in, at the Met, at the Metropolitan Museum, and this uh, painting is owned by the museum. Uh, and the similarity is reinforced for Angel by the fact that, as, st as a steady patron and supporter of Warhol, Gelsaler played Stein to Warhol in the early 60s. Angel further sees in the film a sort of ego magia, yeah, a sort of ego struggle between Warhol and Gelsaler, or rather between Warhol's indifferent camera and Gelsaler's softness and vulnerability. I quote again. The majestic pose with which Gelsaler begins this ordeal, sitting upright on the couch, glasses on, hand on his hip, is soon replaced by obvious expressions of ennui and discomfort, and disintegrates into a nearly fetal posture by the second reel. End of quote. In his recent book, The Black Hole of the Camera, uh, critic and filmmaker J.J. Murphy echoes and expands Angel's views, proposing that beyond the parallel with Picasso's painting, Gelsaler, quote, attempted to, to go through a repertoire of facial expressions presumably based on various art historical portraits, end of quote. Where he gets this idea... I don't know. I mean, you'll see the film and maybe, you know, we'll be able to discuss this later. Uh, Murphy agrees with the adversarial conceit spotted by Angel and sees Gelsaler filmed from a slightly high angle at a distinct psychological disadvantage. These are literal, quirk, uh, these are literal words. Sweaty, ruffled, regressing, and eventually defeated, Murphy says. Gelsaler clearly loses his battle with the camera. More amiably, Wayne Kostenbaum, in a monograph on Andy Warhol, reads a game of seduction in Gelsaler's posing, but still agrees that the film is an exercise in subjective unveiling prompted by the machine's scrutiny, by the scrutiny of the camera. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> My own reading will sharply differ from these readings. I think there are other ways to read the film without regard to the rhetoric of authenticity or self-revelation and paying attention in instead to the dynamism of its surfaces and materials. In order to do so, I will first place the film in relation to empire, with which it has a generative connection and which it strongly resembles, oops, sorry, and which it strongly resembles, seem both extract from rather static situations and undertow of subterranean, subterranean resonance and hidden noise. I will subsequently delve into the sources of this noise, which for me are Gelsaler's strategies throughout the film, strategies of occultation, mimicry, contestation, and role-playing, along with his manipulations of two pregnant objects, his sunglasses and his cigar. And finally, using the ideas of American philosopher William James, I will reflect on the kind of being that the film presents, rather than deliver any form of subjective truth, as, you know, Gelsaler and everybody else seems to think, I think that Warhol's film presents a state of constant emergence without telos, without end, a gestural and affective flow without reference to personality or self. One way to detach the film uh, you know, Henry Gelsaler from registers of subjective reference is by reading it against Empire. The connection between the two titles is strengthened by the fact that the camera original of Henry Gelsaler was eventually absorbed into the reels of Empire. In fact, it was collapsed with it as reels 11 and 12 of Empire's original negatives, and with them it remained lost for years in a New, in a New, sorry, in a New York photographic laboratory. The cans, however, were labeled with the film's current title, Henry Gelsaler, something that indicates that it was conceived as a separate project. Two separate projects, then, you know, Henry Gelsaler and Empire, but at the same time intriguingly close, 
a building, then a body, the body of a friend, are placed in front of the camera for endless contemplation in two consecutive sessions. These are two very different, these are two very different kinds of objects, the blank face of the famous building on the one hand, and the endlessly expressive moves and modulations of Gell Saller's face and body on the other. At some level, however, both building and person were background elements to Warhol at the time. They were part of his immediate environment. The building was part of his material landscape, you know, sheer backdrop to Warhol's New York life, subliminal, subliminally noticed, one might conjecture, in his ramblings around the city, particularly since it was still the tallest structure in the area and one of the tallest in the world. And the building was even more present than usual in the press and the media around the time of the shoot. As Kali Angel remembers, floodlights, or rather, as she uncovered through, you know, her, you know, you know, incredible research, floodlights had been installed at the top of the building and first lit on April 15th of that year, 1964, to celebrate the opening of the World's Fair in Flushing Meadows. A few months, just a few months before the filming of both Empire and Henry Gelsaller. The person, Gelsaller, however, was a different kind of background, a very animated, intensely interactive part of Warhol's milieu. Henry and Andy had been close since July of 1960 when a common friend, gallerist and critic Ivan Karp, brought Gelsaller to Warhol's apartment on Lexington Avenue. Warhol was quickly taken with Gelsaller's educational credentials, since, you know, Gelsaller had pursued but not finished, if I remember correctly, a PhD in art history at Harvard. He was also taken with uh, Gelsaller's accepting attitude towards mass culture, with his love of pop music, his sense of humor, and his acumen, his intelligence. Looking around Warhol's apartment in his first visit, Gelsaller figured out that the artist must like Florin Stettheimer, a faux naive painter, member of the New York uh, Dada circles in the 20s. And he quickly offered to show Warhol the Stettheimers in storage at the Metropolitan the following morning. Warhol was completely taken. He wrote in his memoirs, right away he became five hours a day on the phone, see you for lunch, quick turn on the Tonight Show, friends. The friendship would eventually cool down, in part because after 1965, Henry had a living partner, Christopher Scott, and in his orbit, he developed a new circle of acquaintances away from the factory. The factory, Gelsaller felt, was becoming, by the, by the mid-60s, more a celebrity haunt than, than an art studio, and therefore was kind of losing interest for him. Uh, the two friends came near rapture when Gelsaller was appointed curator of the American Pavilion for the 1966 Venice. Venice Biennale, and failed to invite Warhol to take part in the show. They would later make up, but for a while, Warhol felt bitter about this desertion. Still, he would never forget, as he put it in his memoirs in Popism, that when he still didn't have a gallery and none would take him, Henry was, as he put it, pounding the pavement for him, trying to get dealers interested in his art. During Warhol's tough transition from commercial to gallery artist, Gelsaller had been a constant encouragement. And once Warhol established himself as a leading pop artist, his friend had been the source for, for some of Warhol's most brilliant works. For example, the Death and Disaster Silk Screens and the Flower Series to cite just two. I mean, these were both ideas that Gelsaller threw at Warhol and, of course, you know, he ran with them. Uh, in the summer of 1964, however, when the film was made, Warhol and Gelsaller were still, were still riding high on their friendship, speaking several hours a day on the telephone, calling each other any time of the day or night for banter or gossip. No wonder Warhol used to say that he had been the original Mrs. Gelsaller. This is a, a sculpture <coughs> from their common friend Marisol, uh, the Venezuelan uh, sculptor, painter, relocated to New York, uh, you know, that shows them together dressed identically to sort of, you know, emphasize the kind of, you know, the, 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 the connection between them. Uh, so both, the, both Empire, the Empire State and Henry Gelsaller were part of the backdrop of Warhol's life, but further ties connect the two films. Both may be watched at length, yet remain inscrutable, fulfilling in some ways Warhol's dictum that the longer you look at something, the more it becomes drained of meaning and the emptier and better you feel. The idea is witty and rhymes with Warhol's praise of surface and mechanical inexpressiveness, yet I feel it is not entirely right. It seems to me that the, more, that the more one looks at something, especially if one does it through Warhol's films, the more this something shivers, pulses, shifts, 
and mutates, the more it becomes inhabited by a micrological agitation, a molecular quiver that brings about endless variation and prevents the observed phenomenon from fully coinciding with itself. Such molecular vibrancy lies, lies at the heart of stardom, one of Warhol's obsessions. The great stars, he wrote, he wrote, are the ones who are doing something interesting every second, even if it's just a movement inside their eye. Uh, end of quote. Except that with the right kind of attention, everything is a star. Everything is doing something interesting every second. After all, everything has a tendency to metamorphose and exfoliate if only one watches long and closely enough. In Empire, which is again, you know, this eight hour film of a of a building. Uh, this agitation comes initially from the boiling grain of the film in the first reel. You see the little dots that make up the image. Uh, the film goes from near complete whiteout at the very beginning, as the lens aperture has been set to night illumination, to the slow emergence of the outline of the Empire State in a field of boiling grace as the light ebbs out of the sky and the sun goes down. Once the image settles into darkness and the top of the Empire State blooms with light, the internal movement in the image arises from a series of largely involuntary phenomena, flares and whitewashes caused by improper exposure of the negative, faulty laboratory processing, light occasionally leaking into the magazine, and by the regular recurrence of the blinking light on top of a nearby building, on top of the Metropolitan Light Insurance Company, on the left of the image. You have the you know, light there below the Empire State. Uh, further surprises arise when the lights are turned on momentarily in the room where the camera has been positioned to film the Empire State. For three separate instants, and they're really flashes, they last a second, Warhol, his assistant John Palmer, and underground filmmaker and programmer Jonas Mikas are briefly reflected in the window panes before the light goes out again. Given these spectral human appearances, it makes sense it makes sense somehow that Henry Gelsaller ended up lost at the end of the reels of Empire as a longer materialization of human presence, in some ways as still, and in some ways as a stir, as you know, moving as the as Empire's nightscape. The surface disturbances that punctuate Empire could be regarded as noise, a fuzzy growth on the image that prevent, prevents straightforward reception models its sense and pushes it toward the indiscernible, indiscernible sorry, and formless. Henry Gelsaller is similarly a buzz throughout his film. While he does nothing in particular outside idling on the couch and smoking a cigar, he never stops doing something. Shortly after the film starts, he pulls out a cigar, lights it up and starts smoking, and con continues to do so until about 10 minutes before the end, when he stubs it out energetically. I hope it's about 10 minutes before the end. It's a little unnerving to speak about the film and then have you see it, and then you'll catch all, all my mistakes. But, you know, ignore them, okay? Uh, smoking is the most continuous action that he engages in. In addition to smoking, he pulls a pair of sunglasses out of his pocket, puts them on, later pushes them up on his forehead, down again on his face, and eventually stores them away on his shirt pocket to retrieve them at various points throughout the film. He pulls out an ashtray onto which he regularly shakes his cigar's ashes. I think I'm really making this interesting for you, am I not? Uh, he produces a handkerchief, blows his nose, blows his nose, uh, st stares down at the ground and looks straight into the lens. He's occasionally lost in his thoughts, apparently oblivious of the camera, but at least twice he's pulled out of his reverie uh, by an off-screen presence, perhaps Warhol himself, at which he smiles and arches his eyebrows. He frequently runs his hand through his hair and tucks it behind his ears. He, he not only moves his facial features and hands, his body shifts vertically and horizontally within a sort of cross inside the, fa inside the frame. He slides up and down the couch, and when he slides down, his hair sort of sticks up rather comically against the back of the couch, and he leans sideways, prop his head, props his head against the arm of the couch, or comes to rest, odalisque-like, on his elbow facing the camera. Throughout, I find him likable and even handsome at times, and you'll think I'm crazy. I can see the liveliness, the charm, and the responsiveness that lured Warhol. Yet I am not convinced that all these gestures deliver a personality. They rather make up a gentle rumble, the murmur of a body just being, rubbing against the things of the world. One could call Henry Gelsaller a noisy portrait. Noisy because it is somewhat against the grain of traditional portraiture, which had aspired to encapsulate a rounded off distinct image of its subject, conveying its meaning, whether social, psychological, psychological or historical. 
Instead, Gelsaler's microscopic movement and subtle effervescence is emphatically not about himself or about a self. It seems to me more a dialogical interplay with some objects at hand. Besides, there are in it, there are in the films, degrees of citation, mimicry, and provocation that take us away from interiority and subjectivity and place the images in an external, suprasubjective constellation. Let us look in some detail at the way he plays with his glasses and at his smoking. Both actions are oops, sorry, a sort of basso continuo, a sort of continuous bass running throughout the film. We know that smoking is what Warhol had in mind as the skeleton activity on which to hang the rest of his friend's gestural exuberance. But what about the sunglasses? Gelsaller pulls them out at the start of the film and they prompt him to considerable play. They look quite similar to the kind Warhol tended to favor. As far as I've been able to track, these are Moscot Milson tortoise shells, first marketed in the 30s as a leisure accessory for golfing, tennis, some bathing or driving. You may spot them in, for example, the pictures of uh, Jacques-Henri Lartigue, uh, who was fond of, you know, uh, portraying, you know, people in, you know, driving cars and, you know, the sportive life of the interwar periods. Uh, it may not be easy to figure out the exact connotations of this particular piece of eyewear in the 60s, but I assume that it had a vintage touch and judging from my acquaintance with the trends of the period, they were not common. They quickly became part of Warhol's persona. He wore them day and night, in and outdoors, at leisure, and what I find more shocking at work. I don't think it has been remarked how odd it is that Warhol mixed that Warhol mixed color, painted and silk screened with tinted glasses on, as if in complete disregard to nuances of shading, and yet you know he's a great colorist. Uh, by putting on practically identical glasses as those of his friends, was Gelsaler perhaps mocking Warhol, offering himself as a satirical double of him? Was he resisting Warhol's conceit that the film was about Gelsaler? Warhol wanted Gelsaler, Gelsaler on film. He would get imitation and instead. We may see here a different form of egomachia, a different form of struggle than that suggested by, a by Angel and J.J. Murphy, and even by somebody like uh, Amy Taubin as well, who suggests also this kind of struggle between Warhol and Gelsaler, the camera and Gelsaler. Uh, the struggle is more playful and equal than they seem to think. Gelsaler doesn't wither under the camera at any distinct psychological disadvantage, but acts back, not in an idiom of psychological truthfulness, but in parody. In addition, glasses block his eyes, if not completely. They render solid and somewhat opaque what is usually liquid and transparent, the eyes, ultimate seats of human expressiveness, fabled windows to the soul. Hence, besides parodying Warhol, Gelsaler may have been resisting his gaze, impeding his complete visual availability and thwarting his friend's voyeurism, a voyeurism that, as Douglas Crimp has pointed out in relation to the film Blowjob, is always complicated. It's never just about catching the other in the power of the gaze. But the glasses also turn Gelsaler into a vaguely humanoid presence and make him partly alien and inert, in part because of their originary association with technology, with flying and motor racing, which goggles help make you humanly endurable, uh, sunglasses depersonalize the face and bring the body into the orbit of machinery and objects. Vanessa Gilbrown, author of a forthcoming book-length study about the cultural meaning of sunglasses, maintains that they connote the inhuman, the cyborg, the alien, and perhaps bondage and fetish, two sexual practices in which the body is equated and confused with things and materials. Not a fetish accessory here, at least as far as I can tell, maybe you'll discover something that I didn't. Uh, sunglasses, however, contribute to turning Gelsaler into a thing among things. Their curves echo the loving embrace of the couch, and both couch and shades and glasses rhyme curiously with the soft roundness of Gelsaler's body. If sunglasses make Gelsaler opaque, remote, and humanoid, what does smoking do? He does it, uh, sorry, how does it signify within the film? Gelsaler makes much of his cigar. He contemplates the smoke that wafts from the tip and the clouds he blows into the air. He exhales slowly, at times in you know, cute little puffs, uh, other times in powerful mouthfuls. He moves his fingers to disturb the smoke flow and watches it curl unpredictably. All this has, in part, a characterizing function, as Gelsaler was indeed fond of cigars and was often savoring one. Warhol's mid-70s portrait of him has him posing with a cigar in hand. His smoking here is similar to, but gentler than, filmmaker Emilio Antonio's 
drinking an entire liter of whiskey in the film Drunk, something that the Antonio, the filmmaker, often did without Warhol's encouragement, but presumably not in 30 minutes as he does in the film. But smoking also has further meanings, further signification, in addition to being this characterizing element, in, in addition to being something that, you know, that Gell's allergies usually is. Uh, a bit like the sunglasses, which withdraw the subject from immediate availability, smoking creates a sphere of self-enclosure and solipsism, as it is ultimately, ultimately a solitary, autoerotic pleasure. It is a pleasure, besides, that recalls primary orality, the state of fusion with the mother's body. This body and this state of fusion are gradually forsaken by means of what psychoanalyst Donald Winnicott famously called transitional objects, repla replacements generated by the subject, among which are the voice, breathing, things introduced into the mouth to make up for a lost breast, and eventually props that combine orality and tactility, such as blankets and stuffed animals. Smoking is a belated descendant of transitional objects and a remnant of pre oedipal enjoyment. Its prominence in the film recalls the oral pleasures that, it has often been noted, populate Warhol's universe, the candy he adored, the kissing and eating that appear in some of his earliest films, the banana chomping and fellating in Couch, Harlot, or in Mario Banana, or the logorake quality of his superstars, you know, the, this sort of verbal diarrhea of the superstars, uh, many of whom are non-stop talkers who love to listen to themselves and banter interminably, and for whom chattering away is often indirect continuity with sex when it does not replace it altogether. Late talkies like Biker, Bike Boy and I Am Man are great examples, I think, of this, you know, how, you know the, the continuity and the, the actual replacement sometimes of sex with, you know, endless chatter. Uh, besides being solipsistic, smoking is a gratuitous luxury. It is an activity without remain other than ashes, themselves emblems of ephemerality and finitude. And it is also an activity without purpose, beyond the production of a fleeting pleasure that cigarette packages remind us now may very well kill. Jacques Derrida has placed smoking in the family of the gift of gratuitous expense of luxurious squandering. While it is a thoroughly modern habit in the West, you know that it was an American import that did not become popular in Europe until the 18th century, it introduced a residue of ritual and un unre unrecoverable outlay expense in a culture more and more characterized by functionality, profit, and optimization. Derrida makes smoking synonymous with giving one's time to others as a companion, since while smoking it is autoerotic, as I suggested before, it, is, it also cements friendship and sociability. And he also equates it with giving oneself to time, to mere duration. One passes the time smoking, which is also getting outside clock time or regulated time time apportioned to distinct activities. In this regard, tobacco has the temporality of fantasy, daydreaming, or narcosis, all techniques to rise above the mere metronomic sequence of time. Gelsaller smoking touches on these various significations. He gives his time to Warhol, who captures his friend on film, and further slows down his parsimonious becoming by manipulating the projection speed of the film from sound to silence. But Gelsaller also gives himself to duration and thus walks out of the gridlock of utility and purpose, becoming absorbed in absorption and losing himself in himself, which is not necessarily in his self or in a self. And losing himself, himself in this manner, he also delivers us, spectators, to a time of idling, fiddling and pondering, to a time like that of smoking without a goal other than the rather diffuse one of exploring the minute convolutions of his face and body, the smoke of his cigar. This is actually not from the film, okay? I hope no one's trying to quit smoking because this is going to be torture. Uh, and I, you know, get into the last part of my talk. You may be, hap you may be happy to know. So, I will. <laughs> So by smoking, Gelsaller loses himself and loses us in a time of joyous waste. But as I have repeatedly and perhaps pretentiously underlined, he does not lose himself 
in a self, in an e, in a in a personality, in an individuality. In what then, and if not a self or a, or an individual seal of authenticity, what is it that Warhol presumably captured with his camera? What was that something that Gelsaler felt had been revealed through the film? Why did he feel that the film gave him away completely? What in fact did the film give away? One of the things that the film gave away is a degree of transitivity between thinking and facial and bodily expression, which ripple with the moves of his train of thoughts. One cannot presume to know what Gelsaler was thinking, but it is easy to discern the affective tonality of whatever flashes through his mind. He appears childish, surly, wary, distracted, happy, and by his own confession, slightly stoned. He mouths the words to a song, which he accompanies by a drumming of his fingers. Then he appears concerned again then relieved, then bemused, then fatigued, and fatigue brings on another whole choreography, eye rubbing, forehead touching, face covering. Often the shifts in mood are accompanied by changes of posture, as if a new thought triggered a realignment of his entire body. Uh, Gel Saller described the gestural range he put out for the camera as going through his entire vocabulary. The term is, is quite accurate, since what he offers, what he offers to the camera is something like a lexicon of corporeal effect in which the terms succeed each other without transition, smoothly sliding from one to the next. There is no morpho there is no morphology or syntax in this parade of effect, only an abrupt juxtaposition of distinct expressions that act as lexical as lexical units, you know, distinct, you know, uh, gestures that just, you know, he goes from one to the next abruptly. Perhaps rather than a particular individuality, what one reads in the film is the dispersed plurality of moods, traits of character and dispositions that make up subjective experience, a plurality that may only reductively br be brought brought down to a self, a character, a mood, a personality, a me. Hence, what may have been revealed in the filming session is less a Gelsaler than the extent to which Gelsaler, any subject, is a field of emergence that only with difficulty may congeal into what we call a self. In other words, the film may have shown with blinding clarity that while mental activity is ceaseless, there is nobody home to harness it, no one necessarily at the wheel. What I am saying now is largely inspired by the work of American psychologist and philosopher William James, who developed his most influential work between 1890, when he published his Principles of Psychology, and 19, 1909, the year of his death. Because mental life unfolds in the form of proliferating multiplicities, sorry, multiplicities precariously tied into chains of association, James proposed to conceptualize it as an additive structure based on what he called conjunctive connections. The, you know, you can see that Deleuze picked up on some of his ideas. The bits conjoined here are what he called events of pure experience. These were neither internal nor external, neither merely objective, given outside ourselves, nor merely subjective, conjured up intrapsychically, but both depending on the context in which they might be integrated. Immediate perceptions of, objectivity, of, of objectively given reality enter trains of memory and association, and once part of psychic life, they exist on the same level of reality and with the same causative strength as fantasies, convictions, dreams, or emotions against the idealist notion that an entity called consciousness wove these events of pure experience into continue into a continuity of self and gave mental life a unity james adopted what he called a radical empiricist stance he denied the existence of consciousness quote that entity is fictitious while thoughts in the concrete are fully real end of quote and further declared that the events of mental life were made of the same stuff as things are these are literal words and that things were homogeneous with psychic phenomena I admit that there is quite a jump from the pragmatist philosopher of the 1900s to the pop artist of the 60s, but it is hard to resist bringing the two together in relation to this particular film, in which thought is constantly transformed into facial configuration and bodily posture, translated, translated into fidgeting with objects, 
with glasses and a cigar, and into leaning against a couch, and in which the succession of thoughts bespeaks an irrepressible multiplicity that overshoots potentially subjective co cohesiveness. James, James once stated that the idea of a continuity of consciousness was probably inspired by the interiority and the continuity of breathing. He says, the stream of thinking is only a careless name for the stream of my breathing. The I think that Kant said must accompany all my objects is the I breathe which actually does accompany them. End of quote. Thinking as breathing is made visible in Gelsaller's smoking. This is another way in which the film renders thin like the presumed intangibility, the presumed immateriality of mental life and evokes abstract depths in mere smoking. In the end, then, the triviality of subjectivity and the profundity of mundane everyday gestures may have been another of those nagging truths that the film revealed. In this manner, it did not give away Gelsaller as much as the messy unfolding of uncontainable experience that enveloped him during that magic hour that the film took to make, and that will envelop us during the 100 minutes that it takes to watch. I hope you enjoy it. Ja, yeah, thank you very much. And uh, ich wechsle ins Deutsche. Wir machen jetzt fünf Minuten Umbaupause. Um, in der Zeit, das Filmcafé hat geöffnet. Sie können sich da nochmal was zu trinken holen. Und dann werden wir durch einen Gong signalisieren, wenn es weitergeht. Bis gleich. Juan. I actually... Um would like to just start, I, I, since I was sitting next to you, I saw you were taking a lot of notes during the screening, and I'd, um, I'd just be interested to hear how you, um, how you, how your own experience of seeing the film after giving this particular reading played out, what your thoughts are about your reading in relation to your experience watching the film. Um, well, it's hard. I was just making sure that I have got the details right about, you know, just the different movements that he makes and the gestures and so on. Uh, I mean, I was glad that almost everything was right in a way. Uh, but I also, uh, I, I see it as much slower now than the first time I saw it. I must say that I, I had only seen it once, but it was a very, you know, very thorough kind of, you know viewing at MoMA, took a lot of notes. Uh, and now I see the film, I mean, now I notice that it's a lot slower than I remembered mm -hmm. it. I mm -hmm. thought it was like a, the changes from mood to mood, you know, from gesture to gesture. I remember them as being a little bit more abrupt. Uh, but there is a very gentle sliding from, you know, one phase and one pose to the other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know, I feel kind of confirmed in what I said. I hope that's a good thing. But I don't know what other people would <laughs> or what you think about it. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I definitely will open it up um, to questions in just a second. I, um, I guess I feel confirmed in what you were saying, and maybe some thoughts. Um, maybe be good to try to re, re to um, summarize once again what you were saying, um, and perhaps to do that just by bringing in um, an extra element, namely the the flares that we see, because that's not something that, that was part of your analysis, but it yeah. seems that it lends itself quite well to your analysis. Yeah. The fact that throughout, particularly the first role, there were so many of these um, just white flares that we're familiar with, um, let's say from the screen test, from um, or from the end of roles in a Warhol film, but, um, but it seemed like it's probably what, like the light getting into the the camera magazine or something during the filming or 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 during the development um but but it seemed to me to kind of emphasize the the if you will um 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 the 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 way in which the body slides into the material of the film the way in which the body somehow um the the whiteness the connection between like his, he's not really wearing a shirt, he's wearing white, <laughs> it seemed to me. The, the brightness of the light seemed to take away kind of a specificity to at least the upper part of his body and his, sometimes his hands only become hands when they're up against the couch or when they're touching each other. And I felt that the flares seemed to also emphasize this kind of, um, um, in this sense, the, the material of the body becoming the material of the film. If you, I don't, I didn't summarize your argument, but no, I, yeah. 
I can't do that right now, but, no, but, but I wonder if you have some thoughts about, about this issue. No, I think it does introduce another level of eventfulness that is not gestural, it's not personal, it's not bodily. It doesn't come from the person, that it comes from, but it comes from the machine. So it made me think of not only the temporality of the body kind of hanging out and just doing nothing, you know, in front of the camera, but also the, there's a different temporality that comes from this accident, which I think that the magazine mm -hmm. is really not properly closed, and that's why the light leaks in and, you know, whites out mm -hmm. the film. Uh, so that is sort of yet another level, another kind of rhythm that mm -hmm. is superimposed over, I don't know, the smoking and the playing with the glasses and the, 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 the sort of constantly moving, you know, from gesture to gesture. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but I think it does, um, I mean, it's a little bit like what happens in Empire, which is this film where nothing happens, but a lot of these little accidents take mm -hmm, place mm -hmm. and they add this level of, uh, again, it's a very microscopic eventfulness over a basically static situation. So this is what I thought in relation to the flirts. I must mm -hmm. say, I, I sort of had noticed them, but I didn't work them into my analysis. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. uh, They are a lot more frequent in the first reel, almost throughout, yeah, than yeah. in the second one. In the second one, maybe they noticed and they closed, prop, you know, more properly the the, 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 the the magazine so that, the, mm -hmm. you know, there's only leakage at the very end, which is common, you know, when the mm -hmm, film is about mm -hmm. to run out. Uh, but not not so much before. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, okay. Thank you. I'll leave and, it. And maybe something else that you asked me before is like you know if I would like summarize again the you know the main idea that I mm -hmm, tried to bring mm -hmm. up in relation to the film. And that main idea was that I found it extremely difficult to. Uh, I mean, in a way, it's a portrait film, but I am not sure what it tells me about this fellow. You know, other than that he engages in a huge amount of expressions that go from you know, sullen or angry to naive to, I mean, sometimes he seems to be sort of uh, play acting, you know, uh, acting the vampish kind of seductive lady on the couch. Other times mm -hmm. he's completely lost in his thoughts. I mean, sometimes he seems angry. Sometimes he seems shy. Sometimes he actually seems very sad. I mean, there isn't a Henry Geltzaler. There is to me a sort of constant flow of affect a plurality of emotion mm -hmm. a plurality of gestures so i think it's completely different from what traditional portraiture does which is freeze the subject into a, an extremely meaningful condensed uh, view of the person here i think it's more about dispersal and i think that's why i gave that title uh, uh this uh, das das Flug, das um, um, Flug, yeah the, the mm -hmm. face in flight or something, mm -hmm. even though I didn't sort of, you know, uh, sort of attach so much to it in my in what I did. But I think that's basically what I would say about the film. And also I was trying to get away from the idea that there is an authenticity about it. I mean, I, I don't think there is so mm -hmm, much. Mm -hmm. uh, and that there is sort of a struggle and that Henry Gelsaler is defeated by this uh, stare of, the, of, a, of a merciless camera that holds him down and wrestles him down to the ground somehow. I think that mm -hmm. there is a, a sort of constant fencing is a bit like a boxing match but you know the blows come back and forth and I don't see him defeated or anything I uh, think he actually ends you know with a very mischievous look at the camera like like well what do you think of me now I don't know I don't mm -hmm, see him mm -hmm. defeated I think I see him playful and sort of uh, sort of prompted to kind of be comical at times to be kind of silly I don't mm -hmm, know. Mm -hmm. anyway so I wanted to also get away from the you know dominant reading of the film that is both you know somehow a picture of and some authentic personal authenticity that the camera can capture and that there is a sort of struggle you know to see who comes up the winner I mean I, these two things didn't seem to make sense to me when I saw the film mm -hmm, and they mm -hmm. still don't when I saw it this time anyway mm -hmm. sorry I've no no, no thank long. you thank you thank you Vincent, uh, this is a direct follow-up to just what mm -hmm. you were saying. I, I mean, I, I completely agree that the the idea that he's somehow defeated by the the machine of the camera is silly, uh, <laughs> and is belied by the film. And, and I mm -hmm. completely concur with you. Um, I'm also interested in what you were saying uh, about the, the portrait and and his uh, let's say the rhythm of the film, of the succession of the expressions and gestures. Um, you know, if if you listen to a talk like yours before watching the film, there's of course some priming effects, uh, <laughs> and you go looking for certain things, or you keep certain things in mind. And the, and and the one thing that absolutely haunted me while watching the film was the quote from Geltzaler himself that you started the talk with. The what? Sorry, the quote. Oh, yes, yeah. 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 
because what struck me about it is that Geltzoller appears to be claiming that it is a portrait and appears to be uh, tr suggesting that we read this in a quite, let's say, conventional way as a portrait, uh, stressing the revelatory nature you know, of, of the film, saying, and then that's an interesting turn of phrase, if I remember correctly, he says, um, it contains a complete repertoire of my mannerisms. You know, and what interests him, uh, him or seems to be interesting him is the completeness of of the picture that the film gives, and the revelatory nature of it. You know, he, he, he speaks from a position of himself watching the film, and recognize him himself. But what interests me is the second part of the phrase, uh, a, a repertoire of mannerisms. Uh, I was I was thinking uh, of of some of the work that Jonathan Flatley has done that I'm familiar with to the extent that I'm familiar with it on portraiture um, in Warhol and and um, Douglas Crimp of course uh, picks it up in his book and argues against the notion that people in Warhol's films are just being themselves and uh, arguing against the notion of precisely of authenticity and. Um, I basically just wanted to ask if you could comment some more on what Geltzoller says about the film in relation to your reading, because in a way you seem to be rejecting what he says, or at least the first half, while reconfirming the second half. Yeah, no, I agree about the repertoire. He also says, you know, what does he say? Yeah, that, that he goes through his whole history of gestures or something. Anyway, but I, I do agree about the inventory thing, but I'm not sure that that inventory, I mean, exactly what you've said, I'm not sure that it adds up to first a singularity, a oneness of the person, because I'm not sure that there is a oneness anywhere. I think that a lot of Warhol's work is about the multiplicity, the, sorry, the multiplicity of selves in various situations. A lot of the films are about play acting, about characters pretending to be what they're not. And, you know, just being as, I mean, the real authenticity is that you can be completely inauthentic and be, you know, to change in a way, uh, you know, uh, mood to change your own, your own kind of regist personal register, your, per your personal kind of appearance, you know, as you change suits. I mean, it's part of, you know, what we are is that we are changeable entities. And this is what brought me back to uh, William James, this psychologist who at the turn of the century was actually saying this about, you know, uh, about subjectivity. I mean, he does have a very powerful article that's, is, that says, uh, that is titled, Does Consciousness Exist? And his claim is that it doesn't, you know, that we're just collections of sort of floating, uh, I don't know, signifiers, floating signs, gestures, impulses that somehow cohere sometimes. Some, some, sometimes they don't, but that we are not a wholeness. So now why would Gelsaler be invested in this kind of, you know, notion of authenticity and this really gave me away uh, I am not sure, but perhaps it's a more legitimate, how can I put it, it does, uh, you know, maybe he wanted to somehow see himself memorialized in a way, you know, encapsulated uh, in the way that a traditional portrait would have done it, you know, and it's, it feels more comfortable to say, oh, this gave me away, this captured me, than to say, uh, well, you know, this was just a fleeting hour of my life where I did all sorts of silly things and it doesn't really eventually mean anything about myself. I don't know. I guess maybe he was reaching after some sort of. Uh, He's also a curator and wants this to be an artwork. Yeah, yeah. No, I agree. This is a very interesting idea. Yeah. So he's reading back into it as if, uh, yeah, yeah, and placing it on the on the same level as I don't know the the, the Picasso portrait of Stein or something like this. Yeah, yeah. No, I, I think this is a very interesting thing. Yeah. David Hockney didn't do his portrait yet of Henry Geltzaler, so he wasn't sure maybe if he was going to get his portrait. <laughs> Probably, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, Henning Engelke and then Rembert Huser, yeah. Um, uh, I was just uh, wanted to comment on this this white shirt again oh, because I think it supports your argument of the fragmented nature in a mm -hmm. formal respect. Uh, I had the impression that the white shirt sometimes really seemed to sever his head from the rest of all the things. Mm -hmm. the, the head seemed like painted into the picture mm -hmm. and seemed, seemed quite isolated and the shirt didn't fit into this space at all. The couch was quite 
properly exposed, I think. There was the, the exposure meter seemed to have been directed at the couch. You could see all the felt details and uh, and the, the shirt stood out from this. And then I wanted to ask you um, your, your argument um, about the flow. I found this very convincing. Um, but uh, I was just wondering if you couldn't have made a very similar point by referring to sort of cybernetic ideas of uh, self-adaptive behavior uh, and things like that and, and the whole notion of consciousness that would uh, also be uh, questioned by these cybernetic ideas. Uh, consciousness is as an effect of certain feedback mechanisms uh, uh, and because at the time Warhol made this film this would have been much more on people's mind than maybe William James even though I oh. think uh, it was really quite convincing and and uh, enlightening what you say. No, I think it's extremely interesting what you say about the shirt and about the fact that the yeah it does somehow you know, uh, put the head afloat, sort of above, you know, and separate. Is that? It's interesting. J.J. Murphy has pointed this out, but he doesn't say it as beautifully as you do. And he do, he talks about the, the the his double chin or something as making it seem as if his head were glued. But the f but I think it's more much better, more perceptive what you say and uh, what you mar more Mark also pointed out, that, that it is the whiteness of the shirt that somehow, and it's also a whiteness without uh, nuance. I mean, it's like a mm -hmm. block of white that mm -hmm. doesn't, I and mean, it does depersonalize. I mean, there's like a block of nothingness of something inanimate there. In Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Versus the animation of the face and the hands. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so this is very interesting. As to the other, uh, and yeah, I, this is an interesting thing that uh, yeah, it does support the argument. And if you don't mind, I may use it when I expand this piece. <laughs> and the other thing is that about cybernetics. No, I think you're totally right. And I could have made that argument, yes, about adaptive behavior, and about, about feedback systems that were certainly in the air. Uh, they were more in the air a little later on, I think, in the in the in the decade, more around 66, 67. Um, but I think it's a completely, you know, it's a more topical argument than the one I made. Uh, and you're right. I mean, I, you know, it's it's a different way of looking at it. But but I could have come out with similar ideas eh? because yes, yeah, cybernetics was more about you know yeah behavior as something that is sort of gradually constructed, etc., rather than you know something that comes monolithically you know within the person and that's it. You know. So yeah, no, this is very interesting. Yeah. Maybe the, the machine you mentioned, biggest large impact. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, this is true. This is true. Yeah, this is a little bit related to the cybernetics question, and um, I would like to come back to the flares and um, uh, to one aspect of your talk that I liked uh, in particular, uh, which was when you uh, were talking about the noisy aspect of the, um, uh, of, of the portrait. So you were talking about noise, and I wonder whether one can, re uh, whether one can relate the flares and the noise uh, in a more productive way. So I, I was not really really happy with the first spontaneous response that you gave to Mark in a way when you said, um, oh, they might, uh, they might not have properly closed uh, <laughs> the camera because this, this brings these aspects of intentionality and unintentionality in, in, into the game, which, which I do not find that productive. So I find your thought way more, way more interesting in a way, thinking about what is, what is a noisy portrait uh, what kind of of what kind of noise are we talking about? So, are we, is it is it about what kind of information do we get, and how does this relate to the flares? And I don't care whether they they close the camera properly or not. So, but uh, no, I, I love I love what you said. So that's what I want to say. No, thank you. The, the, yeah, the noise. Uh, I was actually using it in the cyber in the sense that the that cybernetics used it in the '60s as anything that interrupts the signal or that does not allow the message to come through correctly. Um, so I think that yeah, absolutely, the flares would be noise. Uh, also, because they obliterate momentarily the image. I mean, suddenly you have this. Uh, it's like bad reception on well on television now not anymore but when I was a child on the televisions with antenna antennas and stuff that suddenly you you 
you lost the picture or the radio you know the old radios where sometimes you had like fuzz you had actually noise it's what it's called or the tele old telephones also that you were weird buzzes and echoes and whistles and so on so i think it's that equivalent uh, warhol was fascinated with all this i mean he loved imperfection he loved uh you know whenever for example in his silk screens the color didn't didn't align when there were errors in register he loved it he loved it he uh, he often had his mother letter his uh, do, do, you know, letter his illustrations and his work as a commercial artist. And whenever she made a mistake, because she was not a very literate woman, she she absolutely adored it, and that, that was you know better. He, he would never correct it. So this is part of his aesthetic, accepting you know noise as uh, you know as something that is intricately connected with the message, with communication, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and I agree that you know I, I think that when we're, we're talking about you know the closing of the magazine, I, I'm not sure that we you know I think it. So, not intentional or anything. I don't even think it's mm -hmm. interesting whether it's intentional or not. It may have been sloppiness, you know. I think just um, due to the history of the series that, that often such questions in relation to Warhol's film come up as to, wait a minute, were these roles in the right order or what happened? So I thought it was good to kind of sort that out right at the beginning. But but I also, I think your your concept of a noisy portrait is really quite powerful. And a noisy portrait, Phil, I think is... is is really interesting. It was really um, resonant during the screening of the silent film. Like I, I really that, that stuck with me. I'd love to. Maybe we'll talk more about it. But I, I know there's another comment from Regina Pranger. Yes, I, I I very much agree with your main idea that you say it's a critique of portrait and there's no wholeness. Uh, as an in individuality or totality of a self. And I would like to focus the formal qualities of the film to, to underline, to, to, um, to say um, that there is um, an idea of totality of, or wholeness uh, by means of uh, the line uh, constituted by the couch, <laughs> this art deco uh, furniture. And I would um, claim that this is also a film about f furniture and, and, and uh, objects mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the white shirt and the, the battle <laughs> between this human body and this non-consciousness. <laughs> uh, between this um, man and the couch and also the camera, I, of course. But uh, uh, for me, it was so um, impressing to, to see this relationship uh, uh, because uh, it, it is uh, by the frame he, he, he uses, there is uh, the, the, the line, the, the, the frame he, he, he builds uh, by uh, this, um, this couch <laughs> is... is uh, uh, in a way, subordinates him as as a human being. So it's completely different. Uh, it's not a background. It's not a, an ornament. Just it's it's really very active power. Uh, um, and so, I I had the impression that he also parallels the line, which is an arabesque line, and this is an ornament which which has a long tradition and expresses. It has a, a really religious um, iconography. It's I think it's uh, a, rep uh, a representation of totality, and um, he is always to, he tries to reassemble his hair. His hair is uh, I, I think there's a a, um, a parallel a par par paralleling or, or a similarity between this line and and the hair, and he his his poses his gestures. He, he he's permanent he permanently repeats them and for me this is the tension so it is between the singularity of the ornament as a wholeness and the 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 permanent um, operations to rebuild to restore and then destroy again and relax again and then again try to uh, to build an order to to give this <laughs> hair again <laughs> Uh, a nice order and so on. So for me, this this is uh, the movement of the film. Could you 
see this like yeah. this? Well, I could totally agree. <laughs> I mean, is that, no, I think this is it's a really, really great reading. I must say that this is the, um, it's almost embarrassing, but this is, the, this is the, I hadn't noticed the, the, that double framing before. You know, I agree there's the framing, the square, mm -hmm. the conventional square of the camera, but then there's that, that other framing that curves. The first time I saw the film, I just interpreted it as, I don't know, sort of rhyming with the roundness, with the sort of softness of the, of the body. But I, I totally agree with what you've been saying. I mean, it is a, a sort of strict formal constraint, like the time constraint and like the, 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 the square of the frame, of the film frame. But it, do, it is different because it's more dynamic. Uh, and I agree totally with you. I think this is a great way of looking at it, that, uh, you know, there is a struggle between the kind of sort of messiness under or within that embrace, that curved embrace, and the stability of both the square, the, the film frame, and the arabesque. So I think this is a great way of, of seeing the film. And, uh, and it does introduce a counterpoint of stability against, you know, what you've been describing as the attempt to make and remake himself, his hair, his hands, his, the glasses, this, you know, the cigar, the, you know, lights it up, the ashes, you know, all this kind of messiness inside and the stability of that frame. And the, I, I don't know, I found it very interesting. Thank you. This is great. Yeah, uh, before Urs Spuri was sagt, ich wollte nur, oh, uh, sorry, I just wanted to, <laughs> to um, also just add that I, um, I think the, um, that, that although though the couch, war, the couch in the factory has a kind of iconic um, um, what play is an icon um, that there, I don't know of really analyses that have taken the kind of materiality of the couch um, um, into into consideration. And this, your analysis, I think, opens up the possibility. Um, thanks then to Regina's um, comment, also to try to think that through, because we'll be seeing also also the film Couch. We'll be seeing Harlot, um, which are a couple. I think the the other two big couch films i'm trying to think if but i think that that, that, that that's just one through line that that would be a really interesting um um further point of analysis just think it is, yeah. want to add he, that he, as a yeah. he only says if i remember correctly in popism that they found it in the street he says that new york in the early 60s was a great place to scavenge to to like pick things up from the street mm -hmm. and that i think it was billy name who found the couch and and dragged it for like 10 blocks from wherever it was to the factory, which mm -hmm. must have been quite a feat, yeah. uh, and then brought it up on the elevator, and that's it. But I think it would be extremely interesting to, I don't know, know more about the style, the make of that furniture. I mean, where was that? I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah. The, the kind of analysis that you offered of the sunglasses, of the sunglasses to incorporate yeah. a certain kind of analysis of the couch, yeah. perhaps. Yeah, it'd have to. And the be. ashtray. Yeah, we'd but have that's to a check. different thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. Um, also the cigar. The cigar. Ah, okay. What brand cigar? Yeah, exactly. Sorry, it was spree. I, I would like to ask for a comparison between this film and Sleep, because it's also uh, just watching a, a man doing nearly nothing. And uh, I think it's it's completely different, because uh, once he's awake and the other one is sleeping, and I, I feel it, it makes something completely different with me. So I, for me, Sleep was much more intense. And uh, I wanted to ask, uh, what do you think about it? How would you compare these two movies? This is a really interesting point. I, I must say I haven't thought about it, but I, I mean, you're totally right. There's, you know, one is evidently all movement and the other one is all stasis, all, you know, sort of no movement whatsoever. And sometimes even which the image. Which? Uh, I mean, well, all movement is Gelsaler and no movement is sleep, I would say, but you don't agree with that. I mean, there is a slight movement of That's, the breathing, right? Well, I'm, uh, and, I'm and there's sorry. changes so, I of mean, posture. Yeah, there is. And, like and there's like hardcore editing. I mean, that, yeah, there's hardcore you know, the editing, inherited yeah. view yeah, yeah, would yeah. say that there's no movement, but mm -hmm. the first two hours, there's this constant repetition and variation of the segments. So it's really, it's an action film for two hours and then it kind of slows down. Um, and then it comes back at the end. Uh, anyway. No, no, you're yeah. right. But I was thinking that the, the, f the individual frames represent a fairly static subject. Mm -hmm. but except for that one time, there's a, a, a looped frame when he sort of, you know, he's asleep and then suddenly changes posture. And mm -hmm. that is like really shocking the first time you see it. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you remember, sort of toward when, the end of the film. But, it's, yeah, but yeah, you're right that it's mostly, I mean, here. That's when he moves his head back. 
or something yeah. like this. Yeah, yeah. He kind of, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know. Sleep has been talked about as a film that is reminiscent of death and there's a certain deadliness about the subject. There's a, a memento mori and blah, blah, blah. Uh, uh, well, people see death all over Warhol. Yeah, this is true. This is true. Yeah. Whereas this one, I see much more of a, of a much more alive film. I mean, the subject is much more, it seems to me, much more kind of, I don't know, there responding to the camera, you know, being silly often. Uh, uh, but I, beyond that, I don't, I don't know. I mean, the the sort of palette, if you want, is I mean, mm-hmm. Sleep is a much darker film. Well, it's, it was made with available lighting, mm-hmm. night conditions, and whereas this, you know, here we've talked about the brightness of the shirt and the. Uh, I also wonder if you think I'm, I'm sorry. I know the question was to Juan. I don't want to like showboat as the moderator, but but the. Um, Think of the difference between the fragmentation of the body in sleep and the kind of um, what the kind of immateriality of the body here, or the body only making its materiality known through the the particular gestures or actions that you mentioned. Whereas in sleep, it's really about a kind of organization of shots of a fragmented body. Uh, um, and I'm just offering sort of tools for analysis. I don't have a take on it, but. But just but one one way of thinking differently about them. No, but I agree. I agree with that. And I think that some people have mentioned, a, you know, a slight parallel between sleep, where you know sometimes the framings are very hard to read. I mean, you don't know exactly what you're looking at, and it takes a while to figure out that you're seeing like maybe the chest and the nose that sticks out because the mm-hmm. camera is really mm-hmm. low on the guy, and uh, and a film like uh, Geography of the Body, which is mm-hmm. um you know 40, 1943 film by Willard Mass and Marie Menken and other people, who is about you know shooting parts of the body in a way that they're almost unrecognizable. You just see like folds of flesh, but it could be, I don't know, the crack of an ass or it could be, you know, the, the mm-hmm, mm-hmm. crease on an elbow or something. I mean, there's something completely defamiliarizing about it. And in both cases, bodies are treated not as seats of personality and subjectivity, but as, as matter, as material, as expanses of flesh and skin. And well, I, th- I, I think it's much easier. It, maybe it depends on who you're hotter for, but... But I find it much easier to eroticize uh, John Giorno's body in sleep. Um, I, I don't. I'm not making a comment. I think Henry Geldzahler, to my surprise, appears incredibly seductive in this film. Um, I say that to my surprise because I never found him seductive in, any, in anything else. But um, but but I do. But but we shouldn't forget, of course, that that John Giorno's naked in the film and so the kind of fetishization of the body that takes place through the fragmentation um is a is a fetishization of 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 a naked body sleeping in a bed um so it's a it's already a different kind of situation that asks to some extent for a different degree of intense involvement than than this clothed sort of immaterial body here and, and if, we, if we wanted to be a little biographical, which we may not want to be, the you know John Jarno was Warhol's love interest at the time, and they they tried to have sex, but Jarno didn't you know, it didn't work out. So somehow Jarno was this inapprehensible thing, object of desire that Warhol wanted to have, and he could have him asleep, you know, filming him, but not in real life. Whereas Gil Zahler was more of a, I mean, there was a, a different seductiveness or a different eroticism, not necessarily sexual, but that had more to do, I think, with Gil Zahler's, you know, mind, his knowledge, his kind of, you know, com- his liveliness as a conversationalist, I think. Mm-hmm. And so it's a, it's a slightly different approach to the two subjects, I think. Which isn't just, odd, I mean, that's biographical, but there's also in sleep, it it is shot it, often from the perspective of someone lying in bed with this other man. I mean, it's I was shocked by the tenderness in in that massively long film. Sorry, Regina Pranga. Uh, just a detail. I, um, maybe I had uh, would uh, give another answer to your question. Um, there is one common uh, subject I think that's the visualize, visualization, the the make visible, making visible uh, the breath. Breath, breath is uh, uh, John Giorno is breathing all, all the time, and you see it, like his uh, body is uh, uh, moving. And I think uh, um, the smoke, the cig- cigar, is, uh, is has the same uh, role, the same function, just to to make visible his breathing. So and 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 it's the same 
connotation, the, the machine, the, the, the body as a machine, because uh, the smoke makes him disappear as a person. In, in, uh, it's, it's like the flares, the, the smoke is another, uh, another flare. This whiteness is the same as the smoke, and so death is also present for me in this film. And uh, he's also, you could also say, uh, he, he, he paints <laughs> the smoke or the cigar is, uh, is his um, brush <laughs> and he makes a, a kind of brush stroke. And I think this is also a, a tradition in painting he refers to because there's a portrait by the Nor Norwegian painter Munk, uh, an auto um, self-portrait. Uh, um, fuming as, with a cigarette, and the cigarette, the smoke is used, is employed as uh, dissolving uh, uh, the person and um, m makes the color, just abstract color, visible. So it's kind of um, abstract, abstracting, distancing from personality in this, in this fantasy actor painting also. I totally agree with that. Yeah, I think it's part of a, it's a, another strategy of, <coughs> excuse me, of uh, occultation, of sort of hiding, of removal, of you know, I'm here but I'm not. You see me but you don't. And he often uses the smoke to cloud over his face as, okay, I'm here for the portrait, and yet you know, right. loof, I'm not. So yeah, yeah. no, I totally agree. Yeah. Yeah. And your Crossover. I would like to come back to the couch. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> I'm so inspired by your th thoughts um, and by your talk as well. And um, I was uh, was just thinking constantly about comparing Henry Gerzalas and fashion shoots. <laughs> so, but maybe this comes because I've read um, your book about the bike boys <laughs> and um, this comparison about um, Andy Warhol knowing Vogue and then filming the hustlers um, in the 60s. And um, so um, I'm just wondering, um, after Regine Pranges' um, arguments, um, if it's some kind of fruitful to compare fashion shoots and um, the shooting of um, Henrik Gerzahler, um, because then um, comparing the um, this posing for fashion um, in the white, evident like backgrounds without um, anything, just white. And this um, with the couch and the line, then your argument um, would be bring out, uh, would be come out to the fore, I guess, because then you remark more. If you think about, um, mm, or you're lining or you're linking this with um, Warhol's knowing about fashion and fashion shoots, then um, it's more evident that he's um, really um, thinking about giving images of people. Um, yeah. To, uh, yeah. Okay, point. <laughs> so I hope it's understandable. Mm -hmm. You want to answer this? Or <laughs> I, I I don't immediately. The only thing I thought of like, was another couch film <laughs> from Morha, as you we were talking, was Camp, which ends actually with Doña La Luna, supermodel, the first black supermodel, um, kind of like doing a runway walk um, in in the factory. But but I, I don't have a specific. I, I I'm, I'm not sure about. I think it's an interesting thought. I somehow don't see this setup as a kind of fashion fashion shoot setup, but um, other than maybe the, the blinding light so that he doesn't have any pores in his skin, <laughs> um, sort of the Photoshop avant la lettre or something, but, but I don't know if you have thoughts. No, I, don't, I, I think it, is a sort of, it would be a sort of anti-fashion shot in many ways. Um, I mean, it seems what I find interesting about Warhol and fashion is that he uses the structure of fashion on unfashionable subjects and people who are not, I mean, who are cool, you know, because they were dressed, I don't know, sort of in a personal way, sometimes not even trendily, 
but they uh, but what he does is he understands very well the mechanism of publicity the ability of an image to sort of freeze a particular flow and then to put that flow into the sort of public sphere uh, but here I think that it's not so much about that I think it's about the opposite the, it's about the fraying off and the sort of dissolution of the pose because the, the fashion photography is more about posing about freezing models into particular poses that show them off to advantage and the, uh, you know it's a very uh, you know it's almost the opposite of this here is all flow is all movement it's all sort of slightly inapprehensible whereas fashion photography I think if it has to be something it has to be clear it has to be very uh, apprehensible of you know what people are wearing of the way this is supposed to look of what we are supposed to think of these you know combination of I don't know haircut accessories blah 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 uh, whereas he, uh, so it's much more about legibility, and this is more about illegibility, I think. Uh, but what I think he that, that connects the two ideas is that uh, you know Warhol directs his camera, uh, you know, with a, in a very deliberate manner to these uh, unfashionable scenes, knowing or somehow wanting to sort of capture them and put them in circulation. I don't know if I'm answering somehow, what, but I think it's a very interesting sort of connection to make. Well, um, if there are no last comments from others, um, then then perhaps um, we should end before one thirty for the first time in the series <laughs> and um, take the moment to um, thank once again Juan Suarez for coming and delivering this yeah. wonderful. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you. All. Thank you. Und ich springe wieder ins Deutsche. Ich möchte natürlich die nächste.